Pants my my ass. I'm on my floor. Bonjour, Monsieur Pussycat. Cracking toast, wit. To start uh, spreading the uh, news. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the short podcast about short films. I am your host, and we are discussing the Academy Award for Best Animated Short. Today's episode is about the 30th year of the award at the 34th Academy Awards, which celebrates the films of 1961. Today's guest is the host of the One Inch Barrier podcast, discussing the nominees of the Best International Film Oscar category. Please welcome Juan Carlos Ollano. Hello, Carlos. Hi, Jackson. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much. It's an honor to have you. It's just like you were kind enough to invite me on your podcast way back when. And now now that I have my own, I will invite you onto mine. Yeah, I'm so happy that you started your own and, and also taking on um, uh, a category which like, you know, like the category that I took on, you know, people kind of see us like a sidebar category mm-hmm. and i don't like that i i don't like that because like the same way with international feature film as a whole host of artists that are giving their all like right now you're doing animated short and this category has gems mm-hmm. this is a place where a lot of artists either begin their careers or even uh, seasoned artists go back to the art of making short films um i don't like treating short films just as like a stepping stone it is an art form in itself so i'm glad that someone is doing the job of you know creating a, an oral history for this category so yeah i'm so honored to be invited thank you yeah it, it, i've said this many times but yeah that is exactly the reason why i'm doing this whole podcast and especially focusing on this category in this first era i guess of it just like the the short film categories are always just pushed aside. People rarely watch them unless it, like for animated short, it's just like, oh, they'll watch the Pixar short that aired with like their newest feature or whatever. But it's just like they rarely ever give it a, the time of day beyond that. And so it's just like going year by year and discussing like the history of like animation, uh, history of this category. It is just it's so fascinating to see just like how it there, there is so much of animation history that people have overlooked that you find in this category. And it's just so beautiful to like, for me to like, just go through the history and see all these little pieces like come up. And it's really, really fascinating. But before we get into everything, just tell us what is your familiarity with the best animated short category? I have tried to watch um, the more recent ones, um, you know, some some of those are were easy to find because usually they go with Pixar or Disney, and those films are kind of attached to their animated feature contender, <laughs> so mm-hmm. that happens. But I think the first year where I was, what I was really able to fully dive into this category was actually 2020, um, you know, the pandemic Oscars, um, and. I actually love that group because it was a lot of different styles. Mm -hmm. Like I saw this film called opera and I thought, no way this is, this should have happened, but it happened and it's such a glorious nomination. Um, So that's in the modern era. Um, But in the, the more classic era, I've only seen 1948 because I did another podcast and that has also um, made me watch the contenders for this category, not just the nominees, but even the shortlisted ones. Mm -hmm. And I was just extremely fascinated because a lot of the films nominated or that won in this category were films that I casually saw on cable. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think people don't realize it, but they've actually have a good dose of seeing the some of the nominees in this category. So, but yeah, I think it's a different thing when you start to actively take on these films as you know the ones selected by the Academy as the nominees for animated short film, as opposed to fleeting childhood memories of what's showing on Cartoon Network or something yeah. like that. But yeah, yeah, it is really funny just how like 
like people like like you were saying people don't realize it but especially in these early years there is a lot of like record very recognizable films because you get like the like tom and jerry the disney shorts or it's in things like and the looney tunes like all pop up in this category and it's just like pe people have no idea that these like i feel like very few people realize that they started out as like things that would be on feature film screens and much less realize that these things have won oscars or nominated and it and so like those early years like with the guests like they just like suddenly realizing while they're watching the nominees it's like hey i've seen this nominee before and i've seen this yep. one too it's like i and just having those memories come back but for this year uh uh, we are getting into the time period where the the shorts really start to become obscure, or and good. Uh, <laughs> yes, that is a good thing. It's a very it it becomes a very interesting time because it's like I, I discussed before how like the theatrical animated short has pretty much died. Well, at least in terms of like the Hollywood uh, mm -hmm. Hollywood making those shorts, and so this category becomes filled with a lot of uh like a non-American nominees and independent nominees. And it's just a very strange and exciting time for this category. And, and that's a good transition into this, uh, into these nominees. And there are five nominees this year. Uh, our first nominee and the year's winner is Ersatz, also called The Substitute or Surrogat, uh, directed by Dusan Vukotic. Uh, this is the first nomination and win for Vukotic under the banner of Zagreb Film, an animation studio from Yugoslavia, now Croatia. And that gives us a hint as to why I wanted you on this particular episode, Carlos, since this is the first non-American production to win the Best Animated Short Oscar. Uh, we've previously had nominees from Canada and Czechoslovakia. And while Monroe last year was animated in Czechoslovakia too, uh, that was directed and produced by Americans, while this short is wholly Yugoslav. Uh, Zagreb Film's design philosophy, like many other limited animation pioneers, was an attempt to go against the overly detailed and lush Disney style and took influence from the works of Czechoslovakian animator Jiri Trnka, specifically his short Derek or The Gift, uh, and the animated sequences from the film The Four Poster, which was done by John Hubley, John Hubley and UPA. And not just Zagreb, but Eastern European animation in general has a philosophy about not giving the audience too much text. Don't beat the symbolism into their heads, another way in which they try to get away from the, from the overly moralizing Disney animation. Uh, but back to Ersatz, uh, the short is about a man going to the beach for the day and everything he brings is inflatable from his car to the fish he catches to the woman he lusts after. Carlos, start us off. What did you think of today's winner? Well, when when you invited me for this year, I was just like, yep, I think this is going to be my brand. <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> like, all right, it's it's not made in the United States. All right, I'll I'll I'll, I'll have it. <laughs> um uh, with this year, I I actually was this was interesting because I I start I I I I watched this last. I think I just have that with me. Um especially with the winner, I tend to watch the, the film last. Because I, I like putting the pressure on the winner. It's like, <laughs> prove yourself. But anyway, uh, I am, I'm so glad that uh, the Academy went for this. Of course, I don't know how much percentage of the voting body actually saw the contenders. That's a problem sometimes. And actually, that's mm -hmm. sometimes also the deal breakers with these categories. Like, which one was seen the most mm -hmm. uh with this one i st very strong visual style and i when you were telling me the philosophy of it, it like it makes a lot of sense because ersatz sticks out in this category of nominees the other four were all kind of like in the same mold of um cinematic storytelling their use of visuals um even music the sense of humor, even the rhythm. But with this one, it's so decidedly like the antithesis of that, you know, very strong visual style. And it really takes its time to build humor. And the humor is actually kind of mature. Like this is another thing that I have also observed with one other nominee, but I think this also kind of falls 
into that uh that notion of like even the, the female character the, these are shapes <laughs> okay, these are shapes but um they're obviously there there are like a female character here and the female character is kind of sexualized in a way but mm-hmm. that's also intentional but again um sexualization of female characters in animation has been documented especially with the Gina Davis um, Center for Gender and Media I think so given that i was actually able to enjoy how much it makes you work it's not exhausting to watch but it makes you really lean, lean in because you don't have the safe um the safety net of understanding everything that's going on you have to really observe and with the film the the concept of shapes and how they morph it kind of reminded me of that nightmare not not the nightmares that that terrifying sequence from inside out (laughs) where they were transforming to shapes to from 3d to 2d um and it gives it identity i think it gives the animation more it gives I want to say it gives a reason why it's animated mm-hmm. um, not a lot of animation not a lot of anim- some animations have a tendency to be like why are you animated mm-hmm. um, I love that this film was from technically speaking the I think there's a difference in the shapes and the style of the shapes and the style of the background and also just the sense of humor is kind of dark I'm all kind of all over the place with this one because the film is a lot of, it's a mixture of everything. And I just, it it's, it's 10 minutes. It's both lean and packed. And I don't know. I just was so glad when it was over because then I realized that it was, it's singular creation. Mm-hmm. It's in a way leaning towards experimental storytelling but you know it's also narrative because there's a clean through there's a clear through line there is a guy who comes after a girl mm-hmm. and they're both shapes <laughs> and they're both inflatable and there's this shark um it's 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 very distinctive and right now you know as i'm describing it i still see images of it mm-hmm. um I don't know what the, really the story is about, but the images stick. And I think it also with animation, you really have to have a strong visual storytelling and also um, very wise sound design. So yeah, I could say that I have been elaborating it because there's so much to unpack in the 10 minutes that it gave us. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm really glad that um, we're starting off with this one. Yeah, it, it is really such a distinct thing. And I, and I was watching... A- so I recently f- found out that uh, Zagreb Film has like a YouTube channel where they upload a lot of their short films and stuff. So I was wa- I watched a few of them uh, the other day. Hey, and it's just like each one is such a distinct, unique uh, style. It's not like they they have. It's not like Zagreb has like it, a specific style that all their shorts fall under. Every one is such a unique piece of work, and like this one. Uh, I could easily see this kind of thing be hung up in like a museum or something, just like any given frame. It's just like, it's very reminiscent of like the works of Kandinsky and stuff. Uh, and it's just like, and you mentioned the musical style. I, I love the the little humming song that the main guy does. I, I mm-hmm. can't recreate it, but it's just like, it's just something that I can hear in my mind without actually, you know, hearing the, hearing the notes or anything. And it's like, I, I really do love like how everything is inflatable. Every single thing that you see on the screen is something that is inflatable. Oh, and it's just like, and what it really, uh, to me, it really just makes this thing. It's just like everything that happens is just like this main, the main guy's creation. It's like what he wanted to happen. It's his own kind of idealized fantasy of his own day at the beach. It's all so just manufactured or it's like, and so it's like, he and he like blows up the woman or whatever her and is just like and then it's like the guy's just like her boobs are too small and so he inflates her up a bit more and, and then she rejects him but that that's also what he wants because he wants to be able to like chase after her and like save her from his old shark that he blows up uh, and then and 
And then she goes off with this other guy and he has to save her from that guy. Like, well, not save her, but, you know, take her as a slate. And I've seen in looking at like other reactions on Letterboxd to it is this like people are calling it misogynistic. And it's just like, but the the short is like, you're not supposed to identify with this guy. It's just like he is just uh, he he's a character that you watch not identify with as it's like this guy is misogynistic it's a comedy about him and his kind of like patheticness his materialism and all that and it's just like and which is a really interesting criticism considering you know this is in yugoslavia this is communist yugoslavia uh and so it's like of course they'd be very critical of like the materialism of you know the the west and they're all their inflatable pool old toys or whatever and just stretching that to the extreme and so it's just like this is just a very very interesting short however i did feel it went on a little bit long mm-hmm. <laughs> i i was a little bit bored by it because it is just kind of tonally the same throughout so like it's a very interesting short to think about uh, and a very interesting short to look at uh, but it's just like i just think it, it goes a bit too long it isn't as fast-paced as i would as I would like this to be, but still, it's a very good short. Very glad this one. Very glad I watched it. And, and just one little fun fact: like, I'm not sure how how much you've watched The Simpsons, uh, but there is this one segment in some one of the early season episodes where they have a short film called "Worker in Parasite." I as a slight, and the creators of The Simpsons like specifically cited like this short film as like inspiration for that one like fake communist short film that they they showed on the show that they showed in the show or whatever or and i and i just think that's a very fun fact that this oscar winning short film went on to influence the simpsons it's just like these a lot of these short films have influences that you don't even recognize are going to be influenced by this one thing and so yeah yeah I really i'm like gonna it. yeah I'm going to admit that I'm not very well versed into The Simpsons. Like, I think my introduction was to The Simpsons movie. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> That's but it was a great. Fine. Yeah. Um, I just also want to say, um, number one, I think we can appreciate art even if it, we have problems with it. Yeah. Um, like, you know, uh, I think we can recognize that Gone with the Wind is mm-hmm. kind of racist, but also it's terrific filmmaking. So, that's one thing. Number two, I think the film is aware that the that the main character is an asshole, mm-hmm. um, but and uses comedy to tackle that. It's just a matter of like, was it able to make a clear line that it's making fun of the asshole and not making fun with the asshole? That is a a, a discussion that has had to be had, but. If it's just like oh the 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 short film is misogynistic again, I was already already discussed like there is a misogynistic trope but then in this one it's intentional Mm -hmm. so when you already elaborated that this is not a person we should root for because in the end we saw his demise yeah is that a a spoiler oh no we he can talk spoilers (laughs) like how at the end at the end he's driving home on his inflatable road but then everything just pops and even the main character he himself was inflatable and he 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 shrinks down into the little shape. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so I think with that, we can we can have that discussion of like, why is it misogynistic? But if we're just going to brush it off as one misogynistic, then I think it kind of eliminates the surprising nuances that this film has with, you know, given how um, in a short run time and it can be simplistic and even, even repetitive in what you said, and I kind of understand that. But mm-hmm. there are nuances in, in the comedy. And lastly, uh, you know, when you mentioned it is made in communist uh, regime, it kind of makes me realize because I think, um, well, at least what we see with the ideas of um, mm. self-proclaimed communist regimes, they are very macho. Like you always see like the strong leader, mm-hmm. the strong male leader, you know, the, the Stalin, the, the Mao, the Kim Jong, the Kim's <laughs> Kardashian. <laughs> so Kardashian. <laughs> I think it also lends to that. Like, I don't know how much I haven't explored. I didn't realize that there was a page. I, I can't, that's what I was, I was going to ask. Was the page uploaded during the pandemic? 
Where did the video? Oh, uh, the the Zagreb film what, YouTube channel. Yeah, did they upload the uh, shorts during the beginning of the pandemic? Um, I not entirely sure because um, I think Moss Film did with their films. Um, the the Russian company. Uh, they only started this channel uh three months ago. Oh well, yeah. So I, but think... I guess we are still in the middle of the pandemic. Oh, oh so. yeah, <laughs> we are still providing <laughs> content for people at home, <laughs> um, yeah. which is good because I think one of the uh, few flip sides of the pandemic. Not to say that COVID is good, no, but I think because we were stuck at home and people are still stuck at home and countries still surge in cases, like. It gave the opportunity for hidden films to be released because mm-hmm. there is a need for content. Oops, that's a big word, content. But yeah, there is a need for that. So suddenly these films that we were looking for for the longest time, oh, it's available suddenly. And I think that's great. And with it or sats, it alone, it gives a lot of context with the artist, the company, Mm-hmm. the the kind of government that we're, that company is working in and probably a state of mind like why was the oscar why did the oscars go with this like you know it's an interesting conjuncture mm-hmm. with everything in 1961 at the oscars something's happening that and during that time mm-hmm. we saw it also in other categories but with our sats it's even if one would not agree with everything that's in it it says something and I would yeah. rather have um, something that I have to disagree with rather than something like, eh, I'm indifferent with your existence. Yeah, it, I, I think that is kind of like the reason why this one, because like you were talking about earlier about how like how few people in the Academy will be the ones who like actually end up watching the nominated films and pick the winner. And it's like the way this category has worked like up to the current day is that you have to like, I think you have to go to like specific screenings of like all the nominees and only there can you uh, vote for or yep. the category or whatever. And so it's just like the and when you when you go through this category and you watch the other four nominees, which uh, not to spoil what these are, but they're all very typical kind of Hollywood short films. And then you see this. It's just like, wow. This is the only one that I remember. This is the only one with a lot of depth to it. It's just like, I will gladly vote for this one because it is so just unique in this lineup. And and that is kind of a lot of the reason why we saw like UPA winning a bunch in the last decade. And it's like they're another studio that is trying to go against the Disney style of animation. And when you see four typical Hollywood films and then you see something that looks different you are tend to you're the people who appreciate that something different are all going to go around the one thing that's different meanwhile the people who appreciate things that are kind of the same they're split among the four other nominees so you end up seeing the different one rise to the top Uh, and it's it's a great thing to see we love seeing the academy go for something that is unique rather than picking the same old thing yeah, and I would like to see the Academy go for when they make members watch all five, <laughs> when mm-hmm. they require all five, because that's also a mechanism that they instituted with foreign language film mm-hmm. for quite a while, and that gave her some wild winners. Yes. But I think a certification, at least, that only members who've seen the five should be able to vote. And I think that also should apply for every category, yeah, to be honest. Yeah, really should. Like, especially, like, and they do it with a lot of, like, the quote-unquote, like, side categories with, like, the documentaries and international and the shorts. But they don't do it with animated feature, which is why we end up with every single year ends up going to uh, Disney or Pixar nominee. And it's just, like, and a lot of people who are into animation, like, this is really pissing us off. (laughs) Because it's, like, (laughs) because they end up just voting for the the film that their grandkids saw that they saw of the grandkids and it's just like please watch more of these films yeah <laughs> so they hopefully someday higher... soon yeah they have higher standards for the specialty categories and the major categories like are you kidding me <laughs> what yeah. is happening with you guys <laughs> yeah but yeah 
Uh, do you have anything else you'd like to say about Aerosoft, or would you like to move on to our next nominee? Oh, let's move on. <laughs> let's move on. We, we've said plenty about Aerosoft. For a 10-minute film, we've, we've really done a lot. Uh, yeah, we, we are well into this podcast at this point, but yes. Uh, so our second nominee is Aquamania, directed by Wolfgang Reitherman. Uh, this is the 37th nomination for Walt Disney in this category and the second and final nomination for Goofy. Uh, this short is a bit of an odd one. It came out eight years after the last Goofy short and is the last non-educational short film after Disney's closure of its short film decision division to follow one of the Golden Age characters until the 1980s when we'll get like Mickey's Christmas Carol and things like that. Uh, if I had to guess, the short was just further practice with the Xerox process of transferring the pencil drawings to the animation cells, as all the goofies in the short look the same. And so there's a few bits where it's just like the you see the same animation and just happened four different times. The Xerox process made that a lot easier. And it also defined the kind of trademark uh, Disney scratchy uh, drawing style that you'd see in a lot of their features like 101 Dalmatians and the Aristocats and things like that uh, but on to Aquamania uh, uh, this is about a, the mild-mannered Mr. X who is goofy who can't resist the temptation to buy a boat and goes to the beach with his son and antics ensue and who knew that this was going to be the beach episode of the short pod anyway uh, I, I'm a fan of Goofy and I really like this short well, it's just it's just a fun standard typical goofy short he goes to the beach he he starts a water skiing there's an octopus that wraps himself around his face it's fun it's cute i had fun <laughs> and that's about all there is to really say about it because <laughs> it's just a goofy short <laughs> where he goes to the beach and water skis and he has a boat it's fun <laughs> It's light. It's airy. What about you, Carlos? Um, well, I don't have a relationship with Goofy. Uh, Maybe I think he should. Yeah, I think he should hit me up on Tinder or Grindr. <laughs> Grindr. <laughs> Tinder is like for the, for the. Anyway, <laughs> all right. So... <laughs> anyway, Aquamania. I started with this one. I did alphabetical. Um, except for the winner. Mm -hmm. It was interesting because it started with a narration. So, okay, we are not taking on the point of view of the main character, but there is another storyteller. Like, oh, there's almost like a, a legend um, mm -hmm. vibe to the story. I don't know why. Like, that, that was set up with like, everyone's... I, I don't understand why, why, why they had to establish that everyone's obsessed with boats, mm -hmm. Maybe because it's the Aquamania. Mm -hmm. But then Goofy's obsession with the boat is singular and doesn't really have a lot of connection with the community. So I I actually don't think... I'm not sure if the voiceover slash storytelling device has use because it, it works. And actually, it would bring more absurdity when they didn't have if they didn't have to explain like you know everyone's obsessed with boats. <laughs> um, so if if Goofy was just obsessed with boats, I would be like, yeah, sure, of course. So you know, so that's like, that a question. Um, I think the visuals and the music are fun enough to sustain its runtime. Um, most of the early scenes are like. Uh, obligatory uh, establishing mm -hmm. for the set piece, which is the race. Yeah, and uh, you know, leading up to the race, it, the animation is fine. Of course, I would never badmouth animators because I cannot do what they do. I have friends who are animators, and they lose sleep animating. So, like, no, I have high respect. Um, but with this, it's. It's it's functional, but with when it's in the when it, when when it's when it's game time <laughs> in the water, then it's actually a lot of fun, um, especially with um, the, one, once the octopus <laughs> started coming in, and then there's <laughs> this thing when they were thrown in a roller coaster and they had to go back, and like they were like 
at one point parasailing or something. Mm-hmm. It's 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 really a lot of absurd fun, and I actually wish that the narration didn't rationalize the absurdity, <laughs> because of course they would not do this because this is ultimately um, Hollywood where everything has to align. Like every this feels like an assembly line where this almost should be like minimal variation. It could have just been this bonkers world where Goofy's obsessed. For some reason, he's obsessed with boats and now he's flying and now he's like skiing or something. It's, it, yeah, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's breezy fun. But um, I actually have to go back to remember it because, yeah, it doesn't really stick. Yeah, it's like that kind of ends up like that was really the whole purpose of like a lot of these Hollywood animated shorts. They were just supposed to be a bit of a light fun while you're waiting for your feature presentation to start. Yeah. Or, and so it's just like and uh, so, yeah, Aquamania is just a it's a light, fun, goofy short. I had fun with it, but it's also not something that is going to really stick with me. He, and and just. I just want to comment on the narration part a little bit because this is that's kind of the way that a lot of the goofy shorts work. Like there is the the how to series where it's just like we see a bunch of a bunch of goofies like in like how to how to play football, how to play basketball, how to ski, how to do all these different things. And it's like it was a parody of like these like uh, informational documentaries or newsreels or travelogues or whatever or that that would also play before uh, uh th- the features in in this era of the theater and everything it's so it's just like and so i th- so yeah that is just a bit of explanation as to why the narration <laughs> there. it's a it's a long-running history of of goofy shorts it's like this was his brand or whatever or yeah, but the last Goofy was like eight years ago, right? Yes, but it's just like when they yeah. brought him back, it's just like they, they're they're still going to yeah, stick to the formula. They brought it back, yeah, the formula, yeah, yeah. That's the word, yeah, formula. <laughs> it's it's the Goofy formula, yeah. And and we're gonna see a lot of other formulaic shorts coming up. Yes, actually, I'm ready. Well, <laughs> one of them isn't formulaic, but. Oh, oh mm, I, I, we'll, mm, we'll get to mm, it. We'll get, let's get see. There. Let's see. Let's see what you're talking about. I'm gonna guess. Okay, uh, but we, I feel like we've kind of run out of things to say on Aquamania. <laughs> we're uh, done so with Goofy. We're done with Goofy. <laughs> as, as was the Academy. Uh, so, our third nominee is Beat Prepared, directed by Chuck Jones. Uh, this is Chuck Jones' second nomination as producer, and this is the first and only nominations for Roadrunner and Wiley e. Coyote. Yes, one of the most iconic big guy, little guy duos out there only get one Oscar nomination. Uh, Roadrunner and Coyote were originally intended to be a parody of characters like Tom and Jerry, but then developed their own dynamic and their own group of fans uh with coyote building these outlandish traps and contraptions only for them to backfire in one way or another leaving roadrunner unscathed and usually hurting coyote instead uh be prepared specifically has well exactly that it's just a standard roadrunner coyote cartoon uh carlos what did you think of be prepared I was not prepared. <laughs> you weren't prepared for be prepared <laughs> to, to do this because it was. It's a short one. Oh yeah, like the longest is ten minutes, and that's our sats, and the rest are like six to eight. Mm-hmm. Um, this is where I got the most. I don't know if deja vu is the right word, but like I know I've seen this. I think I've seen this when my age was in single digits, <laughs> in in a different home that we've had. I think in an afternoon, um, air conditioned room, pink curtain, um, like light brown wall, <laughs> and I was watching this casually while lying in bed when life was still good. <laughs> um, so this I didn't turned expect into a whole to memoir. Be, yeah, I didn't expect to be quite emotional when I was watching. Be prepared because. I, I cannot pinpoint the date, of course. I, I wasn't I wasn't doing letterbox when I was seven <laughs> years old. But 
um it it gave me like this feeling of like oh shucks i've seen this before and um you know it's like jumping into a multiverse <laughs> but um <laughs> we're like ah, things were fine but anyway going to be prepared uh i think visually it's it's sturdier than alchemania uh this is more the the, the gags are more visual and it's more composed So I like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do not like the the editing. <laughs> It always yeah. goes fade in, fade out, which kind of reveals that there is not really a strong narrative to put this together. Mm-hmm. This is gag driven. Um, there's not really even substantial character work. It is just two. Uh, characters at odds with each other and that's it yeah. and uh, why the coyote is just trying to prank a speed a speed one's out it's the other one uh, <laughs> the road runner road runner and uh, it always fails and tries again and fails uh, so humor wise I had more laughs but I also gotta say that I was trying I was kind of thinking was was it not having a cohesive narrative a strength or a weakness because if i say it's a weakness then am i saying that should all animation be should have a like a a straightforward narrative like i said a while ago opera from 2020 is almost like an installation mm-hmm. uh, installation animation but it's the, like one of the best things that I've seen from this category mm-hmm. but at the same time um, if it's not the point then why am I watching this <laughs> uh, for lack of a better word you know, I was trying yeah. to um, keep up but yeah it's it's fun and I think it fits perfectly in that scenario that I just described in my childhood that if a young boy is watching this at home in the afternoon, it is, it is passive fun. And I actually had a lot of fun and I'm already 27 and gay. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I I'm, tr- I'm trying, I'm still thinking about it, the narrative part of it, but I think the, the, the visual gags are stronger. Beep, beep. Yes. Um, uh... Oh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it's just like, in in terms of my experience with a lot of these Looney Tunes cartoons, it's just like, I tend to, uh, I tend to enjoy less the ones that are just like gag after gag after gag with no real like through line with them. And like Roadrunner Coyote are the epitome of that, where they're, Mm-hmm. There is never a plot in their shorts. It is always mm-hmm. just here are the characters. Here's one trap that fails. Here's another one that fails. Just so on and so forth until it ends. And it's just like I never find myself having fun with these shorts. Like they're fine, but just like I never find myself really laughing that much because it's just like oh okay, how is this one gonna fail? Okay, that's how it failed. Let's mm-hmm. move on to the next one. And, and it's just like, I, I I guess I just can't like really like turn off my brain to get into like the anticipation. It's like, oh, maybe this time he'll catch it. No, he won't. It backfires. And it's just like, I just can't ever, I never really find myself getting into the Roadrunner Coyote shorts. And it's just like, and I'm kind of glad that this is the only time they're nominated because I would not be able to handle it if they were like Tom and Jerry and they had 13 nominations over the years. And it's just like, oh God. But yeah, so and it's just like, and most Looney Tunes shorts end up do have a better kind of through line with them. It's really just Roadrunner Coyote that I end up having a hard, really hard time enjoying. But but I think Be Prepared is actually one of the better Roadrunner Coyote shorts because it's just like, I think I found myself enjoying some of these gags a bit better. Like I really like the, uh, the one where uh, Coyote puts like iron or something into some food for the Roadrunner and then puts a magnet around him and just 
just so like he's just always attracted to where the Roadrunner is. But then Roadrunner goes onto a train track and he gets hit by a train. And yeah, I like that gag. That one got a bit of a chuckle out of me. But then it's just like, I can't even remember half the other gags. And I watched them like I watched the short right before recording this. And the fact I can barely remember it just so shortly after watching it, it I think that really says a lot about this short and and the Road Runner Coyote shorts in general. It's just they are the epitome of just like in one eye out the other, just light entertainment before you watch an actual movie. And it's just mm-hmm. I wish they were better. I wish I liked them more, but I just don't. Yeah, it also makes me think if the antagonism that that Wiley Coyote has on on Roadrunner would have worked better if Roadrunner had a stronger character. Because Roadrunner is is barely a character. He's totally <laughs> brain dead. Like he just always outsmarts Wiley Coyote. Like I, I sound so pretentious right now trying to intellectualize Wiley Coyote and Roadrunner, but yeah, I think it it gives um a, as a question to um if we're gonna substantiate the experience because you know I think you can have a lot of fun but also have some substance at the same time. Mm-hmm. So uh, with this one, I I didn't mind the gag driven. Maybe it says a lot about me. I don't mind gags. <laughs> I'm sure. <doing> gags. <laughs> I, maybe I, I should have brought you on next year when the winner was the whole. No, I'm I'm fine. I'm fine with this year. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's um, we it, it's 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 fine. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's a good place to end off. Hard to intellectualize it more. <laughs> this sure yeah. is fine. And now we go on to our fourth nominee, which is Nellie's Folly, also directed by Chuck Jones, and with also uh, Abe Levitow and Maurice Noble. Uh, this is Chuck Jones' third Oscar nomination, and the short is about a singing giraffe who is found in the wilds of Africa, whom instantly rockets to stardom. However, her newfound fame leaves her lonely and seeks comfort in a married giraffe at the zoo, which then causes scandal. Uh, so this was the one I was saying that wasn't really formulaic because I knew like, it <laughs> because, well, yeah, because it's, it's the one that like this really does kind of break the Looney Tunes formula uh, because like, like even just like on a surface level, uh, this short doesn't end with that's all folks. It doesn't like all pretty much every other Looney Tunes short does, especially at this time, but this one doesn't have the That's All Folks ending because this one is intended to be a lot more serious and not like a light comedy. It is a, it is a music drama about this. It's kind of like A Star is Born or something like that, where it's just like she, he rockets to stardom, but then is lonely at the top and tries to find some kind of love or comfort her, and then... I, I guess I'll just go through the whole plot of this thing. She gets with the married giraffe, but then that causes her star to fall and the, the giraffe doesn't want her anymore. And so she returns to Africa and she finds another mate there. And it's just like, she was just happy being in her home home. And it's just like, this is really not the standard Looney Tunes fair. And I find myself appreciating it for that. Uh, but also I I feel like this would have been better if it had more time to really get into everything because it does move almost too quickly through a lot of these set pieces, especially like with the Mary Giraffe stuff. And and side note, uh, that is like an intended reference to Ingrid Bergman and how she got with uh, Roberto Rossellini and all that. And that was a big scandal at that time. I mean, it caused her star to fall too, but then eventually she came back, unlike uh, Nelly here. But yeah, it's just like, I really appreciate the short going for something a bit different, especially since this is still a Looney Tunes production, or maybe it's technically Mary Melodies, I forget which. The difference doesn't really matter that much. Uh, but yeah, I just wish it was a bit... Uh, a bit better with its pacing and just like really try, trying to get like the emotions out of the story and rather just you know just trying to tell a short short story as quickly as possible what about you carlos 
I was going to call Nelly a hoe, but then you describe <laughs> her as like um, an Ingrid Bergman surrogate. Like, oh no. <laughs> You're part of the problem. <laughs> I'm part of the cancel culture. Um, well, <laughs> I do want to say that I also appreciate this film. Um, I, I have it on paper when you said that one film here doesn't follow the formula. I put an asterisk to Natalie's fall. Yes, my guess. I was right. Mm -hmm. So now. Like what else? Um, would <laughs> yeah. Because. <laughs> All yeah. right. So now you see here that this is what I'm seeing where it has a strong. Well, like at least a cohesive narrative because it's character driven. There is a clear character, and uh, Nelly is not just either the instigator of jokes or a butt of a joke. Nelly has a journey, mm -hmm. and I believe that jokes are stronger when it's anchored on narrative or anchored on character. So with this one, it even begins on song. So I do love mm -hmm. that uh, song is utilized not as an ornament, but as part of her character, part of the storytelling. I do love that aspect. Um, it's also kind of tragic, <laughs> to is. be honest. Um, the adultery slash, um, what is this? What I cannot read my writing. Um, adultery storyline was surprising because then you're talking about sex. You know, you don't have to word it out, but are just really look, looking at each other. <laughs> like it is mm -hmm. talking about sex without wording it out. And I was surprised. And um, I was trying to think when you said that this is actually a bit short, uh, too short for its story. Like it would have mm -hmm. had more time. It would have been better. I was trying to think if would the film have benefited in its exploration of that aspect of her, you know, tragic, a tragedy because of the adultery, if it had more time. Because of the time that we have now, it felt like a device to bring her down. Mm -hmm. And it kind of read as inching towards misogynistic as well. I um, I, I guess yeah. with the title of Nellie's Folly, it's just like, this is her fault. It is really. Yeah. But but yeah, given that uh, it is in the, in the back of Ingrid Bergman. But yeah, I kind of like, yeah, I was trying. When I was saying that sentence, I was trying to justify it in the film, but I no, what did it with Ingrid Berwin was no. So I'm gonna go with that, that it is her fault. So, you know, I think with a little bit of more time, instead of just showing her, you know, demise or her fall, if it actually showed had cared more about her experiencing that um uh, a more intimate mm -hmm. approach to that fall they would have given more nuance to what happened but you know as it stands you know it's it feels fully formed mm -hmm. and um it it's not I, what i liked about it is that there is humor but it's not chasing after the jokes yeah it comes naturally and it has several devices in its arsenal you know this her singing the um being um you can also say the concept of the diaspora um i was i was i i had these very quick flashbacks of like when she was discovered by i think a hunter mm -hmm. and she was brought to i think a, a fair or an expo an exposition ex something because she was a singing giraffe mm -hmm. um i did remember however like how for those of you who are listening right now, I, I'm from the Philippines. <laughs> so I did remember um, during the American colonization, when Americans saw the indigenous people here, they brought the, uh, the native Filipinos to like, I think fairs mm -hmm. in California. They were caged. So the, the native Filipinos were treated as animals, as curiosities. And then when they were not fun anymore, they were left to die in the United States. Mm -hmm. They were not sent back home. So I, I also had that flash. And I think given that it gave me that gut feeling, I think it kind of got that aspect right of how the exploitation of the quote-unquote exotic 
could it's fun at the moment maybe it's not always fun <laughs> but once you are uh like a used ter- used uh property then you are dead for a good as dead i don't know what's the right word but anyway <laughs> so yeah given that for a film about a singing giraffe <laughs> it is layered not always works but it is layered and there is a there is an arc that i follow that i follow not just a series of gags and it was it was something that stuck with me as opposed to like oh that was fun next film yeah so, it, yeah that was great exactly the, there is just like a lot like you wouldn't expect that something like this would be so uh so thought-provoking so in-depth such a like a sto- a real story but it is and it's just like i i just wish it had some like i'm just repeating myself this but, but i just wish it had some more time to really mm-hmm. like bring a bo- bring out like a lot of that emotional resonance that you can find in stories like this it's like i feel like this would be a great like animated feature if warner brothers wanted to do one of those this time but it's just like they they just kept it as a short film and it's a good short film but it's just like i i want it to be something more but that's how it goes sometimes and i think that's a good place to also move on to our fifth and final nominee which is the pied piper of guadalupe directed by frizz freeling and holly pratt this is the second nomination for frizz freeling as producer though i do believe david h de patty might have been the true producer on this or at least the co-producer but the academy nominated freeling specifically so i will count only him uh, this is also the fourth and final nomination for Speedy Gonzalez and the eighth and final nomination for Sylvester the Cat. May they rest in peace. Uh, this, this short actually serves as an interesting sequel to the first Speedy Gonzalez short. There we see Sylvester was the best mouse catcher in all of Mexico and they needed Speedy's help to defeat him. And now Sylvester has lost his touch and needs to do something clever to catch the mice. He sees a book about the Pied Piper of Guadalupe, which is a play on the Pied Piper of Hamlin, the story of the man who played a flute to lead a mice out of his, out of the city of Hamlin. And so Sylvester takes some flute lessons and is suddenly able to hypnotize the mice to come out, after which he knocks them out and puts them in a jar. And it's up to Speedy Gonzalez to save them. Uh, Carlos, what did you think of our final nominee? Okay, so this was fun. Um, I kind of like Nelly's Folly, but to a different use. I like that there is a prominence of music, music as a source of comedy, not just because the, the music was funny, mm-hmm. but because of what the characters were doing with music. They were fighting each other with music. And that was great because it it, it makes me uh, conscious of the storytelling devices that they were using. You know, it's not going to be, like, I think with that, the moment they use that gag, like, this is not gonna be an animated short, and I'm just gonna like fine. It is the one that is actively using its uh, music as part of its storytelling, as an interesting um, point of um, antagonism between its characters. So that was great. I also like the sense of humor. Um, you know, it's not like huh, that was funny in 1961. Huh. <laughs> like a polite, just like I'm laughing because I respect you. Um, it is really funny at times. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of like because you know it's a I think it's a it's a Latin Latin character, right? I'm not sure if it's Mexican. Okay, Mexican, Mexico. Me, um, the demise of Mexico. I'm not sure if it's. I I'm not sure if it's. I think it uses the stereotypes, but I'm not. Sh- I'm not sure if it's exactly exploiting it, exploiting the this. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. I think they use stereotypes. This yes. one, and sometimes you have to go with stereotypes with such a short time, especially with you know, given the kind of storytelling that this this short has. But I didn't find it to be disrespectful, or at least obviously disrespectful. Um. I think I do have a radar sometimes for disrespectful because I am disrespectful <laughs> at times. Uh, so yeah, I think it was fun because um, it's more simple than um, some of the other nominees. And yet it's kind of confidently formed. 
Mm -hmm. So I don't have a lot of problem with it. I mean, yeah, it's, and it's also also a strong sense of place. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Um, The visual gags are great. The dialogue between the two is also great because it, I didn't feel it as unnecessary. Um, there were some shorts here in this lineup where I, I wish they just didn't speak <laughs> because I think it would have been stronger if it's, it really relied on visuals. But in this one, I'm like, oh, that was fun. Mm-hmm. Like their banter, not, 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 there's not really a lot of banter, but you know, it's, it's, it's still gag driven, but at least there is character between there are characters here speedy gonzalez and um um, sylvester they are characters Mm -hmm. and i understand why they're at odds with each other so that makes for the gags land better as opposed to just like gags alone yes uh so i i just i'm just gonna fill you in on like the history of speedy gonzalez and like because he is a bit of a controversial character because uh he is some some modern critics at least uh view speedy gonzalez as like an offensive uh characterization and warner brothers nowadays sometimes uh tries to limit uh speedy gonzalez's appearance in like modern media and sometimes they try to censor their shorts um but there's an interesting phenomenon where like in latin america and mexico especially uh they have a really big love for speedy gonzalez because he he is always like the hero of his shorts or it's, and he's always like, because it's always like showing like the Mex the Mexican mice, they're always like the victims and the heroes. Meanwhile, it's always people like Sylvester who are like trying to beat them down. And it's like, that's the clear villain of those stories. He's, and so, and like, and it very, and so when I watch Speed Gonzalez shorts, it's like, sometimes you can really tell that they are leaning in on Mexican stereotypes to get mm-hmm. the humor. But other shorts and like this one, this one especially, I feel like the, the the characters are still like based on Mexican stereotypes. As for the short itself, all the humor is based on like the the slapstick. It is based on like like Sylvester failing to get the mice about Speedy Gonzalez taking him down, and it's like that is where the the like a lot of the fun in the short comes from, and so. Speedy Gonzalez shorts like this one, and also his uh, first short, I also really like. Uh, the I find myself not really having a problem with them, although I'm just a white guy. It's not really my place to say whether these shorts are are bad or good representation, but I think this one is just a lot of fun. And like as you were saying, these there's some really good gags in there. I think the way the mice make fun of Sylvester is a lot of fun, uh, uh, and it's just like. It's just a fun short. It, this is a good, solid Looney Tune short that I had a lot of fun with, and just like, which is very hard to come by at this time in Looney Tunes history. It's just like a lot of their shorts at this time end up being a bit mediocre, as as you know, we saw with Be Prepared and Nelly's Folly are a bit uh, not the best. But this I had a lot of fun with, and I'm really glad that this got nominated. And yeah. It's like Looney Tunes has had a weird history in this category where it's just like the famous shorts end up not nominated and you have a lot of like really weird, obscure Looney Tunes shorts end up in the nomination zone. Like what's Opera Doc being like one of the most famous Looney Tunes shorts of all time that was shortlisted but didn't end up nominated. Meanwhile, some just I can't even think of like stuff like Nelly's Folly, I guess stuff that hasn't stood this test of time, but ends up in the nomination table for whatever reason. Uh, but yeah, this one, this is a good solid Looney Tunes short. Lots of fun. Uh, yeah. Um, I think uh, given that, you know, this is several shorts, right? Uh, the, the Speedy Gonzalez is several shorts, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I like think... this is his fourth nominated short. Yeah. I think, think we just have to look into it film by film exactly and uh because for me in this one i didn't have a problem but maybe it's more glaring in the other shorts yes so <laughs> people just have to take it in, but i don't know, um like i think yeah 
like some of his other nominations like uh i think tabasco road and there's another one uh those are a bit more leaning into like the stereotypes and stuff mm -hmm. and so yeah it is a very much a short by short basis but yeah when when it focuses on speedy i just want to say that speedy gonzalez is such a great character like in especially like in his first short there is such a build-up to his reveal how he like he is the fastest mouse in all of mexico and he <laughs> there's this joke in his first short that i love that always sticks with me it's just like they say that speedy gonzalez is friends with everybody's sister and it's just like oh my god <laughs> he is a player he is a, i just love that little bit uh yeah uh, yeah i i do just want to say that i think this is this has nothing to do with the film <laughs> um when i was younger me and my classmates were joking about speedy gonzalez I think I I made a joke about Speedy Gonzalez and they were joking about it, but I've never really seen the image of Speedy Gonzalez <laughs> because <laughs> for some reason when I was younger, all I'm seeing is like Tom and Jerry, and um, and uh, of course Cardinal would suddenly show like uh, Courage the Cowardly Dog <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, Tom and Jerry, <laughs> so I wasn't really able to explore so the others. So I was glad to finally meet Speedy Gonzalez. So. I'm going with Speedy and not Goofy <laughs> on Grinder. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe do a three-way. Who knows? Oh, oh, oh! Are oh. we doing that? Okay. I mean, um, I, we'll just have to see if Goofy and Speedy are into it. But like, who knows? Oh, I, I can talk to him into it. <laughs> Done well, yeah, that before. They, they should have like Grinder group chats, so it's just like you can all hit each other up. Like, hey, how how are we feeling about this? Or, or, or Telegram, you know. I'm kind of used to it. Oh, oops. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I don't do animals. <laughs> I just have to make that clear. Okay. okay. I, I think that is a good place to move on. And that's that was our five nominees. And now that we've gone through them all, let's rank them. Carlos, start us off with your number five. And I have a ranking that I kind of doubted once we had a conversation, but I'm going to stand by with this ranking like a man. <laughs> <laughs> What's a your man. number five? My number five is Aquamania. Ooh. Um, my number five is Be Prepared. As just like I said, I never really cared for Roadrunner Coyote shorts. So it it's no surprise to anyone who knows me that it should uh, it lands at number five uh what's your number four my number four is be prepared Ooh, my number four is nelly's folly he like like i was saying i did have a lot of love for it like when i was talking about it but it's just like i just really it just ends up being way too short for me to really get invested mm -hmm. into it and it's like the other one and I also want to say that my four through first are all very close together in terms of quality. So it's just mm -hmm. very minute separations. Like I, even while we were talking, I did end up switching two of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, what's your number three? Ooh, I'm going to make a last minute switch right now. Okay. Uh, well, be prepared and not come in here. like the bottoms in this group. Um, my number three now You know what? No, I'm gonna repeat my original <laughs> ranking. My number three is the Pied Piper of Guadalupe. Okay, uh, I'm on to the point. I switched. I moved Aquamania down from number two to number three while we we're talking, just because I, while we were talking, I just found myself uh, enjoying my eventual number two more, more than mm -hmm. Aquamania. Had a lot more to say about it, a lot more appreciation of it, and it's like Aquamania. It's just a good standard goofy short, but it's also nothing really to write home about either. So mm -hmm. it just it just suddenly dropped from number two to number three. So what's your number two? Um, no, I I, I do want to say that the, the reason why I kind of tried to switch to N3 is because I thought I really enjoyed the Pied Piper of Guadalupe. But I think I stuck with what took some bigger swings i think mm -hmm. and i appreciated that so my number two is nelly's folly hmm. my number two is ersatz as this like i 
what really killed it for me was just how long it was but it's also like like it i originally had it below aquamania but it's like considering how long we talked about air Sots, how much we had to say about it it's just like i couldn't put it below aquamania which i had barely anything to say hey it's just like i it's a film that i really really appreciate but i also have a hard time watching but even then it's mm-hmm. still a good short it is still enjoyable to watch it's just not as fun as i would hope but still it's a great short that i that really deserved its win and it's like even though i rank it at number two i think i probably would have still voted for it if i were on the nominating committee or the if i were part of the oscars back at this time but it's just uh i just like my number one short more uh and speaking of which what's your number one uh, my number one is our stats. I didn't try to make like a consistent brand of like, I always go with a foreign production. No, <laughs> it's just like, I think I got a lot of most with our stats. And it's the one that um, I might not watch it again anytime soon. The way that I would like happily eat midnight snack over the Pied Piper of Guadalupe. But <laughs> it has a lot of things going in it. And I appreciate a short that kind of pushes its medium. You know, I, the other four, you know, with varying degrees of enjoy, enjoyability, um, you know, still feel comfortably within um, the mold of storytelling and Ersatz just sticks out as just, um, you know, in a way adventurous mm-hmm. aspect of animation, which I always appreciate. And, you know, with, for the Academy to go with that one, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. you know, I always... Because I always appreciate that because they don't always go for adventurous. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, but objectively speaking, oh, there's no such thing as objectively speaking, but no such thing I as think, objective. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going with Ersatz because of everything quality of the animation, the storytelling, everything. So, yeah. My number one is the Pied Piper of Guadalupe. And just like, I don't think this should have won the Oscar because, like I said, Ersatz is such a great a short film but also i just had so much more fun with pied piper guadalupe it is just a really funny short and it's just like like and while it's just like it is nowhere near as inventive or creative or artistically interesting as ersatz i just enjoyed watching pied piper guadalupe more and it's just like i wouldn't have voted for it if i were party academy but i will I will just say I enjoyed it more. And that is what I'm basing these rankings on, just which one I enjoyed watching more. But yeah, yeah. that's our rankings. We we had kind of similar, uh, not really similar, actually. I don't think we ever uh, had the same one in any same spot. Like your number four was my number five. My number four was your number two. Uh, yeah my number three was your number five and so on. So it's just like, but still, I feel We're like not we, a match. <laughs> we still, uh, we still felt similarly about a lot of these shorts. It's just our eventual yeah. rankings just kind of swapped them up because this is a solid lineup of shorts. It's nothing. It's not one of the greatest lineups or anything, but it's a good lineup. I, yeah, and I, 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 I don't complain about the existence of any of these. Like, yeah. um, usually with there are, I think I usually just get r- riled up, railed up, <laughs> riled up <laughs> when uh, that's next time, riled up when I just don't understand. But with this one, I think there are things to appreciate. Of course, there are things to also like consider. Like, oh, that's not really the strong suit of that short. But yeah, I think um. These shorts have different aims and they delivered differently as well. Mm-hmm. So I don't really question. Uh, I mean, maybe I would question if I saw the, sh- the other shortlisted ones because um, that experience that I've done before, what I've also seen the shortlisted that didn't get nominated gave me a lot of perspective. Like what <laughs> mm-hmm. um, that experience, but yeah, um. I'm I'm happy that I've seen these five and I'm happy to be able to have a discussion with this one because um, it's not always that you, you sit down and talk about the animated shorts 
especially from this time, especially with, I think when we talk to people like we've, we've referenced earlier, these were the shorts that we've seen where we were young mm-hmm. in passing. We're not critically watching them before. So maybe there's a, you know, kind of like being taken for granted the the art form of animated short filmmaking. But yeah, I'm glad to be able to sit down and like discuss these five and watch these five in one go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just like, I I really should, like, I haven't been watching the shortlisted shorts, at least not intentionally, but it's like, I really should like at some point just go through and watch like a lot of these uh, shortlisted films just to see like, how like did any of these deserve to be nominated and it's like i know of course like of the ones i have seen i know like certain years there are some really great shorts that ended up not nominated but you know i don't know the details or anything but it'll be an interesting thing to eventually like go through and look at and see what yeah yeah but yeah that is our uh, rankings that's our thoughts on these films uh but before we end our show are there any final thoughts you'd like to share carlos or anything you'd like to promote oh um again i'm just happy to be able to discuss this category and um uh, no, no i'm just gonna ask after recording <laughs> but um but yeah i am really happy to be able to have this start with this year. i haven't seen any films from this year 2020 since the beginning of 2023 mm-hmm. and this is my beginning these five shorts so thank you for jump starting this year in <laughs> film for me and um to be able to have a discussion with, with a new experience um uh i'm currently on a tour with 1961 <laughs> so that's great <laughs> um without a podcast <laughs> um but um you can find me on Twitter at Carlos Ohana and my podcast at at One Inch Barrier. Uh, my podcast is uh, mostly everywhere. Um, if if it's not there, just message me and I'll put it there. And I'm also <laughs> um, just started like to almost like almost three months ago. Um, doing YouTube as a serious thing, like as a serious YouTuber with some <laughs> following, and I'm talking about films. Like, um, I'm really proud of my most recent two part discussion on uh, the BFI Sight and Sound 100 Top 100 Greatest Films of All Time um, with Jean Delman, mm-hmm. and uh, the discussion that went with that. You know, the discourse and watching the film itself. Um, hopefully, you know, as at as the time of recording, I haven't done anything new yet because um, I have some uh, health issues. <laughs> but um, hopefully, I get back to it soon and talk about some Oscar contenders. Like I'm, I'm so itching to talk about films like mm-hmm. Women Talking and After Sun and Glass Onion and The Fablemans and um, Car. Yeah, so. And, and uh, I've already discussed Tar, oh, which was great, and I was wearing what she was wearing <laughs> when she attacked Mark Strong. <laughs> so that There's was no good. Spoilers. This oh, isn't a podcast about Tar. <laughs> no, she attacked him in a dream. <laughs> or did she? It, it's it's up. Oh in yeah, the air. but that's the thing Who with knows? the film. It's a lot of what did did it happen or not? But anyway, oops. Oh, oh, oh. Anyway, and I'm gonna anyway. shut up. Thank you. <laughs> thank you carlos for coming on the show I, i'm glad to have you on and also thank you listener for tuning in this has been the short podcast about short films until next time goodbye <laughs>